year and this year that I have noticed, uh, there are two of them. One is that the age difference in people coming to use the tanks has dropped. And we're now dealing with 17-year-olds, high school students, which is so exciting. That's not happened before since I've been around. And the second part is uh, that the number of centers we thought last year there was a peak in the number of centers that have been started, but this year is greater. And I wonder if we could just see a show of hands. How many of you are in the have a center right now? I don't know if I can see. Help me look and see what kind of percentage we've got here. About Maybe 20? About 20%? Maybe 30. Okay. How many of you have opened in 2014? 2014. Okay. 20%. How many of you won't be open this year but are planning to be open next year? No. Yeah. It's growing. This is true. Okay. I want to tell you the story of Hattie, who is a young woman who lives in Grass Valley. We come from Grass Valley. It's a very small town, about 10,000 people, in the foothills of the Sierra. A very special place, very special people live there. And uh, she grew up there, went to high school there, and at age 23 realized that she had never traveled. And so she arranged a trip and she went to visit her brother in Chicago and a friend in Detroit. And when she got to Detroit, her friend says, hey, Allie, the in thing right now is floating. And guess what? There's a place in Grass Valley where you can go and do it. And that's how she ended up on our doorstep. She showed up to use the tank, then do the next in thing. And what she, uh, what she bought in her float was that she was supposed to make a difference in the world. And that what she had to offer as an artist was to work with the youth to give them successful art experiences. And the course of her float led her to see that she wanted to live to make a contribution rather than to become a consumer. That's pretty potent. The people who are coming to us for training uh, now uh, in this new wave of center owners has to do with people who are coming because of their own passion for floating. Some experience happened to them, like what happened for Howie, that got them so excited that they want to be in a business that supports other people. It's not that they, they want to make money. But money is not the driving force behind them. And that is a different perspective also. Um, they want to run businesses well and have those businesses support the world. The thing about that for me is that that's how we start. You know, we had experience with learning and we wanted to be there. That's what we wanted to do. We knew that. And so we uh, got into the idea of working with tanks. Now, Glenn was already in a relationship with Dr. Lilly because he had done, he had read him and done a workshop with him. And so he had already started uh, making tanks, experimental ones. When I came into the picture, I knew nothing. I didn't know anything about the language of consciousness. I was a teacher of uh, special ed in the ghetto in Los Angeles. And uh, I, I just didn't know any of these things. I happened to uh, be part of a research study in, uh, in uh, floating. And it was a friend of mine who was getting his master's thesis on the flotation tank. This tank had been built by Glenn. And uh, Glenn had been given permission by Dr. Lilly to make tanks for himself as well as for others. He had made some early plywood versions, and I was in one of them uh, that was being tested. At that time, John Lilly had named our company Samadhi, which is in, I didn't know what that meant. And I knew that John used a book by Patanjali called How to Know God. 
And so I got a copy of the book to find out what is this word samadhi, what does it mean? And the definition that I found was during contemplation, when consciousness only, with consciousness only of the object of meditation, let me say it again, during contemplation, when consciousness only of the object in, in, of meditation happens. I, in thinking about that, I figured, well, we're being given an assignment. And that's close to a calling. And we thought that we had the responsibility to nurture the well-being of builders and tenants. That was what our assignment was. It told us what to do when we woke up in the morning and when we had any business decisions today. Those of you starting with your passion for floating can use that kind of an idea, I believe, to serve the cause of your business. Your clients will feel that and probably pass it on. What I think is very useful about the words calling or assigning is that they keep you matched to your own intention. We had two tanks in our home for four years before we opened the first ever float, public float business in Beverly Hills with five tanks in 1979. We were a little worried whether we were going to make enough money and we hired a marketing professor to do some research with our, our clients. And what he found out was that people who were coming were all cultural creatives. Who has heard of that term mentioned in the media? Uh, maybe four people out of about 350, I guess. And who's heard it, uh, not in the media, but have heard it somewhere else? Okay, good. About uh, 20 people. Uh, there was a Stanford University psychologist professor who did research in the late 70s who discovered that there was a new group <coughs> that was with different value systems from the group, the prevalent group that had been in society for years and years. And this, uh, the group that had been in, in uh, society for many years, he termed modern. And their values were personal success and financial gain. And they were into consumption. There was a small group he termed traditionals that had reaction against that group, and they were mostly religious fundamentals. The cultural creatives that were just uh, developing in, in, uh, in society were, had the values of spiritual and personal growth. How many of you have that? Uh, that's about uh, 80%. Yeah. Uh, equality for all. Uh, everybody. Uh, who uh, view the world holistically. Everybody. Uh, who want to help create a new and better life. Uh, everybody. I'm so surprised. Uh, and Authenticity is extremely important. <laughs> Just not everybody. <laughs> so, there is one thing that is uh, pretty strange about us, and that is uh, we all think we're alone. That there are very few of us that, that well, that's, uh, well, that's good. That's great, it's changing. 
that was, that used to be a very uh, big part of cultural creatives is that they thought they were alone. And it's not surprising because the, I don't think most of you have heard stories in the media of them talking about cultural creatives. And in uh, 1979, there were 3% of the population were cultural creatives. By 1999, 26% were cultural creatives. By 2008, 35% of the population were cultural creatives. And by the present, uh, it's over 50% percent in Japan, Europe, and the United States. Can you imagine how disruptive it would be to the powers that be if we all realized, appreciated our numbers and our potential strength? Yes. You know, we just had it in on this for a long time because we get contacted by uh, people from all over the world. And we, there was this guy who was part of the uh, American bobsled Olympic team being trained at Lake Placid, New York. And we, he had been in touch with us about his tank for quite a while. And he called one day and he said, oh, I'm going to be in California. And I have a, a chiropractic, sports chiropractor friend uh, and he wants to have lunch with me, and we want you guys to come. And we went, and we thought, hey, maybe somebody wants to have another tank, or you know, we looked at it as a possibility of business. We weren't there for three minutes, and after the hellos, they were both talking about their own spiritual experiences. And we had that experience so many times where our presence seemed to be a, an opening of a doorway where people could talk about their spiritual life, about their belief system, what they knew was correct. And so, uh, the, wherever cultural creatives have been, they've been looking for us. I mean, that's just what happened. And it seemed like when, where, whenever anybody came to our center, even if they were very strange, if we kind of scratched beneath the surface, we would find somebody who was spiritual. Uh, so it may, still may be hard for all of us to appreciate that these values are real for others and that we can count, in, count on them for our business. But big business uh, doesn't have any problem with that. Uh, Mini Cooper, there we go, uh, is uh, uh, advertising to the uh, ecological contingent of uh, cultural creatives. Here Starbucks is, and here uh, <laughs> Apple is uh, talking to the spiritual contingent. So some people starting centers uh, have the money to do it and are into it for the money. I think better than marketing to the to the moderns, it's better to emphasize the values of the cultural creatives and their risk if they are modern people. It's to uh, be able to uh, learn about the cultural creatives. There are also people who have to borrow money in the opening center, and I would suggest that they should start small and borrow as little money as possible. Because if they end up in a situation where they're, where money is tight, they may end up focusing on money and, and not paying attention to the values of the cultural creators. The third group I want to talk about are have got money and they are passionate about it. And their risk, I think, is maybe not so strong anymore, but at one time at least, it was thinking that they're alone and playing it safe and marketing to moderns. I think it's very important for them to stay true to the cultural creators. As 
Most of you know, there's a guy by the name of Joe Rogan, comedian, who's been promoting the tank, and he has said that through any difficult endeavor, you get to know yourself. You put your character to the test, and you get results. So what is it that limits our evolution? I think that it's our inability to deal with our traumas and our fears. Well, that's a little complicated, because we want to evolve, but we don't want to deal with our fears. Well, the, the, so the market for our tanks is those who want to evolve, but they still may be afraid and not want to deal with their fears. And they may have fears such as drowning, darkness, suffocation, uh, finding out something about themselves that they don't like. Wouldn't it be wonderful if clothing could help people deal with their fears? Well, we can help people because many people have fears before they vote the first time. So if we can help them with that, then they may really be uh, interested in what we have to offer. Well, we've investigated what fuels these fears. And the biggest thing is that it's not okay to be afraid. They are afraid that they're afraid. They're afraid that it's not all right. Thank you. Yeah. The second thing is that they won't be in control, control of the situation. And the third thing is that they have to float a particular way for a particular length of time. Well, we have found that without taking their fears of claustrophobia, drowning, suffocation, and so on away, if we say many people have fears before, we, we say this either on the phone if somebody expresses fear or in person, and we always put it at the beginning of the orientation when we're introducing the person to the tank. We say many people have fears before they float the first time. And people who have fears of being afraid, oh, they issue a sigh and feel so relieved. And we say, you are in control of this situation. You can get in and out whenever you want. You can leave the door open. You can put your towel in the door. Or you can close the door. You can use it in whatever way is comfortable yes. for you. Do you remember that woman who came? We, at our first center, uh, we were doing very well. There was a big article in the paper and we were running full. And a woman came in one day uh, and said, after five minutes of being in the tank room, came out and said, um, kind of sheepishly, would you mind if I brought a, a chair in there and just sat next to the tank for the hour I'll pay you? And fine, you know, we told you, your job is to be comfortable. If you want to do that, that's fine. She made an appointment for day number two and day number three and did the same thing. And on day number three, when she made her appointment for the next day, she said, tomorrow I'm going to get in the tank. And she did. And she came out glowing just like people come out when you get out of the tent. And uh, that was, you know, I just thought that was one of the bravest things she's probably ever been for herself. And can you imagine the incredible power that she took for herself away that she had developed as a result of doing that, that she could then use in the rest of her life? Come about your kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had been floating for about two years when right 
there in the middle of my float, I'm afraid of the dark. Now that seems peculiar. How come I'm afraid of the dark now, and I haven't been for two years? And so I knew I had to do some looking as to what exactly about the dark was I afraid of. And what I saw was that I was the youngest of three sisters, and because of that uh, place in the family, then I was the toy. I was the one that they did things with, like locked me in the closet, which was terrifying to me. And, you know, once I saw that and just ran the pictures over and over again, it, you know, it took a, a session or two, but that was it. It was gone. So that happened to me, and you had one, a good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I've been floating 40, one, years. When I was up here at Portland last year, after the conference, uh, a float-on person named Christopher <laughs> has made a vertical float tank and I floated in it and you float vertically you, know, you have weights put on your uh, on your ankles and I floated and I was in it and after about five minutes it seemed like a bullet constrictor had was around my chest, and I was absolutely terrified. Absolutely terrified. And I pulled myself up so that my chest wasn't under the water, and the uh, tank subsided, and I started breathing again. I don't know, maybe I was breathing, I don't know. I, I, was, I wasn't around. <laughs> not present, not at all. I was somewhere else. And it subsided, and I let myself back down into it, and the terror comes back. And I move myself out, and it gradually subsided. And I let myself go back in. And it raised up again. And I did that back and forth for half an hour before I got out. And I was so thankful. I was so excited. I was so appreciative that here was this thing that was locked in my body that had been there, I think, since the age of two. And I had a chance to deal with it and handle it. It was absolutely incredible. I, was, I, I felt so, so wonderful from having had a chance to do that. So as Joe Rogan says, through any difficult endeavor, you get to know yourself. You put your character to the test and you get results. So minimizing floaters' fears so they don't have them lessens their opportunity to evolve, producing a less powerful result. Well, okay, so we don't have to handle floaters' fears. What about our fear of not making enough money? Well, I don't wish to take your fears away from you <laughs> any more than I want to take the floaters' fears away from them. I know you can handle your fear. Reviewing what we have said here, learning more about culture of creatives, and focusing on those values, and paying attention to yourself, I'm convinced that you can deal with your fears easily. Also, realize that feeling fear and doing it anyway is a great catalyst for growth. 
You understand how appreciating the cultural creative mark of influence influences how you manifest your center. Understanding the market and its values, you will make the right business decisions. You are a cultural creative, so you are the market. So focus on what your needs are and address that in your business. So I came up with this idea about how you know people are building centers or rearranging them. And the word I got was individuation. It's that first center that we built after working from home for four years, we were so meticulous about the details. If you can imagine this, five rooms going straight across the wall. I embroidered number for each door. One, two, three, four, five, beautiful embroidered number of doorways. And we had a small office as well as a big reception area. And he made desks out of white birch that we trimmed with uh, dark walnut trim. We built the furniture uh, that was in the center and we used a palette that was given to us by a local color specialist who suggested that the walls of the reception area be painted the rosy colors of spring sunset. We did. It was perfect. When I remember what we did, it, it said the place became our spirit. We were embedded in that place. We, and we imbued each part of it with our ideas, our passions, our creativity. We brought there everything we had learned from Dr. Lilly. All the things we had learned working from home about how to introduce people to the tanks, how to be with them when they came out. We invented systems, mechanical systems, that kind of let people know their time was up. We learned how to interview the press and have the press interview us to get the maximum benefit. We wrote a center operations manual. This was a physical manifestation of our assignment. We noticed that it resonated totally with the vibe of the tank itself. The more you put into your center, the more you will draw those who want what you have to offer. With tank centers, they'll all have floats, showers, solution temperatures, supreme cleanliness, and so on. I'm suggesting that you bring your specialty, your spark, to imbue your business with your spirit. Individuation. I think it's a good thing. So when floaters come out of the tank, how do you treat them? Well, you want to evolve, and they want to evolve. Some floaters want to be alone, so you create a private little space in the reception area where they can be by themselves. But those who want to talk, can you use that opportunity for you to evolve and for them to evolve? I think the answer is yes. And the way to do that is by you being more present. Let's uh, look into that a little bit more. That may not, uh, may or may not be understandable to you. I think we live most of our life in our mind. We're thinking about the past, we're thinking about the future, we think about projects, we think about relationships. We're, we constantly have this mental chatter going on. There's another place, different from the mind, called being. A space of presence. Normally, most of us don't know how to be present or how to get there, unless we're long-term meditating. Imagine a time when you learn how to ride a bicycle or drive a car 
or some other complex activity like swimming that can't be learned real simply. Probably what you did is that you learned, you practiced the first part of it. And you got that one part, and you kept doing it until finally it became a habit. You were doing it automatically. And now I don't even have to pay attention to it. And there it's going. My subconscious is operating it, and I don't even have to pay attention to it. And then I get the second part. I work on the second part. And I do that for a while until I can finally get that to be automatic, habitual. My subconscious does that part. I don't have to pay attention to it. And I keep doing that until I get the whole thing, and finally, I'm able to be driving for 20 miles, don't even remember having driven that, those 20 miles, and I'm talking to somebody in the car and tuning the radio at the same time. I do the same thing with eating. I no longer have to worry about the tea on my fork. Well, some of us have to do that again, but anyway, uh, or the soup on our spoon. It's become pretty automatic. We can be talking, doing all sorts of things while we're eating. Uh, generally, we can be talking with people and doing other stuff. So our talking has become uh, habitual, automatic, and the subconscious is able to do all of these activities, and we don't have to be around at all. <coughs> well, when are we present? Well, if we're in extreme sports, we do uh, skiing, uh, downhill racing, we may have to be completely present. Or maybe we're involved in a project where time stands still we will be more present. Or our child seriously hurts himself, and suddenly we are completely there. I think many charismatic performers, what we appreciate about them is how they're more present. So when we're present, and we are occasionally, we're more functional, we're more there, we're more capable. This space of being, space of spirit, I think, where is also where creativity and inspiration come from. In the in history, people Creative people have been asked, how, how do you get to be creative? How do you come up with a new idea? And I think if you go back and you listen to them, you'll find that often they're saying, get rid of the mental chatter. You've got to, got to set the, the mind aside, and you've got to be, become more present. I would like you to imagine something for a minute. I would like you to, you may want to close your eyes and imagine that you're at the top of the mountain, snow-covered mountain, and you're looking out over the scenery and you see other snow-capped mountains and the environment is bright and scintillating, shimmering, and you rest warmly, and you feel warm, but you feel the cool 
wind on your skin. You feel it howling, you hear it howling. And you have a sense of peace. Serenity. And off in the distance, you hear the twinkling of little bells from the monastery on the other side of the valley. And you are present. Thank you. You don't take time to process the past or the future in our life. We have all this mental chatter. Eventually, if we spend long enough or frequently enough floating, this mental chatter may subside and we move to being, to spirit. We become more present. Most time machines take you from the present to the past or the future. Ours takes you from the past or the future to the present. Samadhi Pen, time machine to the present.